Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Today I'm going to share a discussion that I had with my friend Sarah over at the Instagram and blog and YouTube channel Briarton Farm. Sarah Jo is passionate about preserving America's history. I actually listened to a podcast that she and her husband did on this topic a little bit around the time that we were buying this house because we were debating between building a house and buying this one. And that was the first time I caught a vision for preserving history and appreciating history. And so she's always a fun person to talk to about that. We had a ton of technical difficulties. I had to walk out to my barn. You can hear the rain at some points. At some points I'm standing near the cottage in the front of our house under the tin roof. So it's rainy, I'm on my porch, I'm in my barn, I'm in my house. I mean, I was all over the place because we also had a sleepover going on at our house that night. So yeah, we pulled together an interview and I think it went well, even though it was a little bit difficult to edit. So I hope that you enjoy this discussion on design, old homes, doing it on a budget. That was the main topic. We definitely went on a few tangents, but the topic we're really trying to discuss is that you can, if you have the dream of living on some acreage in a farmhouse and homesteading or whatever your dream may be, that you do not have to have a large budget to do so or a large income. So whether, even if that isn't your dream, but you have something that you think you need a different income for, the we hope to encourage you that that isn't true. So Sarah Jo, she is an artist. She lives in an 1893 folk Victorian farmhouse. It's a real historical farmhouse in Kansas. And she and her husband took something that was a bit of a diamond in the rough and completely have transformed it and are in the process of transforming it. So we thought it would be really fun to talk about doing that and doing that on a budget. Sarah is anxiously await awaiting her child from India. Yes, I I feel like um, it's really weird because it's it's kind of like being pregnant, but kind of not, you know, <laughs> because- Like a really, really long time. <laughs> yes, yes, and I can see her face and um, we actually got another video of her today from the orphanage, so um, it's so, it's such a weird, you know, and to have this coronavirus keeping us separated longer has just, I don't know, it is so weird. Because you guys, you would have been together by now? Yeah, we aside believe from that. so. Uh, it's, a little tr it's a little hard to tell because um, the paperwork has been um, going on the U.S. side, has been going fairly very, fairly well, um, but then there's a lot of things on the India side um, that have been slowed. And so we do believe that we would have already had her home by now. Um, but we don't know for sure. Um, it was supposed to be spring or early summer and now we have no end in sight. Oh so, gosh. Yeah. Kind of a prayer request. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, you know, something that's really exciting too. I don't want to discourage people from adopting, um, but it has been an incredible journey and just like our house, um, just a growth experience, a character build building experience, um, and our patience has been grown. Um, I guess to introduce myself, I would just say, you know, you did a great job, but something that we're both passionate about is just showing people, um, the possibilities of, of what you can do. Um, and I feel like, that is true uh, in adoption and in restoration or living in, in the country. Um, that's kind of why I, I love sharing um, online because I love to show people. I, I think um, a lot of people see those things as expense, too expensive or, or just too hard. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today, right? Um, yes, just, yes, definitely. Because just encouraging people. Yeah, that you can figure out everything each step of the way. So I get asked this a lot, and I'm sure you do too. Is your husband a carpenter, an electrician? Do you guys, you know, how can you do all this stuff? That's the question. Yeah, um, I love to tell how when I met Michael, he could not hit a nail with a hammer <laughs> literally like we 
We joke about how he would swing and miss and now he's just creating the most beautiful things. So no, uh, just like your husband, mine has no training whatsoever. It's just uh, fueled by passion. And um, so, you know, when you get excited about saving a piece of history, then you motivate yourself to go and research how to do that. And you teach yourself. Right. Yes. So. And I will say too, my husband, he never thought he would be the kind of guy doing the things that he's doing. He just, he didn't, really? he'd never really built anything before. And now just like today, we just whipped out a goat milk stand in one day. No problem. Like he knows for sure he can do that now. Oh, awesome. So he just, you know, you build a lot of confidence whenever you take something you don't know how to do and then you learn how to do it. And so Let's talk a little bit about history. I'm literally walking over to my barn right now because I had such bad service in my house and it's raining, but it feels so nice. Out. <laughs> I've got Daniel in the wrap, but I'm just going to walk over to the barn. But anyways, um, you are passionate about preserving America's history. And that is something that literally was never even on my radar until I met you. And actually, whenever I thought about starting a podcast, like over a year ago, I was like, I need to have Sarah Jo on talking about that. And so you were one of like the first podcast episodes I even thought about. So it's one that's come, it's actually happening now. Aww, <laughs> that's so cool. Um, yeah, I, I think I've become more passionate and more passionate and more passionate as the years go by. It, it's kind of something that has to be awakened in you, I think, um, because you can just be going about your life, you know, in school, you, you sure you learn about history and all those dates and names just kind of blur together and it just, it just becomes blah, blah, blah. And it has no meaning to you, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. And so, um, I think I had to learn to see history in a different way. And something that helped me do that was getting to know the the humble everyday people of history and not just the politicians and the heroes, um, getting to know the, like the farmers, um, the people that built America and, you know, the, the America we know today. Once you get to know their stories, I'm passionate about reading books like Little House on the Prairie because it's a, it's a, it's a peek into the actual people who lived the pioneer lifestyle and it kind of puts a face to it. But even beyond, even beyond that, I love learning about the people that lived here on our farm. And as I learn more and as I just dive into history and, and actually see beyond like the polit politics and, and the, you know, the less thing, the things that I can't feel a connection to, you know, because I'm just a mom. So I want to hear the mom's right. story, you know, yeah. like the everyday mom story. And then I can get passionate about it. Once I learned about the mom that built this farmhouse, now I almost have this little, this little person on my shoulder, like what would Emma do? I, I, whenever I'm decorating or whenever we're doing anything permanent to our house, I always have to say, what would Emma do? And it started to bleed into like when I'm shopping or when I'm, you know, I'm always like, what would Emma do? And that's just really cool to have that connection with her. Yeah, because you, I know you're passionate about the restoration of your farmhouse that you want to honor. And I know you guys right now are transforming your barn and you're painting it the original red, which was a decision that you wanted to do just to honor the history and be, bring the house back to how it would have looked at the time. So I know you said permanent things. Mm -hmm. You want to be mindful of how your house would have been intended to be built. Because, and this is something I say a lot to a lot of people, trends come and go. But staying true to the soul of your home is classic. So even five years ago, something that everybody was doing is not in anymore and people are starting to dislike it and almost make fun of it um i don't know Re do you remember maybe like five years ago six years ago the zigzag pattern was really popular yeah um like and, the herringbone yes herringbone was everywhere um pillows curtains rugs 
Oh, um, Chevron. Oh, Chevron. Yes. yes, that's what it's called. Chevron. Chevron, yes. Chevron was it. And everybody had it, Chevron. It, it was. In every yep. room in their house. And now nobody has it. I don't see Chevron anywhere. No, no, no. Um, and that's just, <laughs> that's just an example. Um, so maybe if someone had done something permanent like put Chevron tile somewhere... I mean, now they have to rip that out. But so it's okay to do that in fabrics. I feel like fabric is a great place. It took me a long time to realize, uh, to let the house tell me what we should do. And that seems to be actually easier to shut off paying attention to trends and try to just immerse myself in history. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I remember whenever I, whenever we were shopping for our farmhouse, I kept contacting you <laughs> because mm -hmm. we looked at several different ones and I'm like, yeah. what's this style called, Sarah? What is this style called? Because I just knew old farmhouse and then you put words to it like, well, that's a folk Victorian or that's a Victorian. And so how did you figure out what the style of yours was and how to decorate it in a way that felt fitting. And I guess we're sort of going off track. After that, we'll get back to the whole making it over on the budget, but. Okay, um, no, but I think that's a really good question because um, what t people tend to do is, I think, I think where you were is very common. People just think old. Well, what does old mean? Like, um, that's too general. And it's really important to figure out the era that it was built in and then figure out uh, what style within that era. My husband actually, I married a nerd, <laughs> so it's been very helpful. And he he's really into architecture. And so I've just learned from him and he, he just will show me books and things like that. And um, I've just gotten more and more interested in it. And before it didn't mean anything to me, but once you um, ha buy a house like you, you, it just kind of like sparks your, your interest in wanting to know more about your house. And then you can dive in, uh, something that when we were talking about your house, um, I was looking at like, uh, does it have a bay window? Does it have, um, a certain roof line, you know, details like that help you identify, what architecture type you have and then based on that knowing the year it was built or or the general time it was built and then this architectural style of your home will give you jumping off points for decorating and restoring okay yeah yeah i mean that was something that i when it, before we moved in i had absolutely no idea and i remember you telling me that maybe mine was more of a victorian actually you were the one who told me that because i always am saying on my youtube channel and people are like why would you call your house a victorian and because whenever i put my stuff in for my last house it did not look right and i was able to figure well you told me it was a victorian but i didn't couldn't really place my finger on it but I knew that when I brought all of my usual stuff in my usual decor style from my last house, which was a 1920s craftsman, that it just looked weird. Mm -hmm. It just looked off. It was yeah. short. It was too straight. Yeah. See, you've woken up. That has wakened in you. Yeah. And you see it now. Well, I can see it. Isn't I just wouldn't have been able to place my finger on why. And But you knew, and you knew you had a craftsman? Oh, how did you know that? I just, I always knew that the thing in, that my last house was a craftsman. I don't know. We lived there for 10 years. So I'm sure somebody probably told me at some point that it was a craftsman. Okay. But yeah, much, much different style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have the tall ceilings. You have the, um, the moldings that are Victorian style. But I think the giveaway that yours is a Victorian is the, you have a bay window somewhere, right? Yes. Like a little... That goes out. It goes all the way from and the first floor to the second floor. Yeah. That's a dead giveaway that you have a Victorian. Yeah. So, and I actually like looked it up to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> now mine is a folk, folk Victorian because the people that built my house, um, they wished they had a Victorian. So folk means that you're, that you're like pretending to be or wanting to be a Victorian. So they would put like 
Victorian moldings around. I have the moldings around the window, but they weren't rich enough to put in like a bay or what are some of the other things that are Victorian, strictly Victorian. Our staircase is kind of fancy. Yeah, your staircase. And how tall are your ceilings? You know, I don't know, but I think they're tall. They're tall. way taller than our last house. Like our la even the main yeah. floor of the last house, because the right. upstairs was much shorter than the downstairs, but even the main floor, these are taller. And then ours are tall upstairs too. Like even in our master upstairs, they're like, yeah. I don't know, 10 feet maybe? They feel tall. Yeah, so that says that, says that your, your farm was at, at some point um, really doing well economically. Like they were thriving and they had the money to be like real Victorian, like build a real Victorian. And so maybe uh, the farmers here, they wished that they were as wealthy as you. And so they just put on some of the pretty uh, details, but they didn't actually have the money to build a Victorian. Well, what kind so, of sometimes throws me with our house is it's not a Victorian like the ones in town that have all of the different like spires right. and you know it still looks very basic. So that'd be a that's a Queen Anne. Ah, okay. So the ones you're describing is a Queen Anne. So that would be like the top tier Victorian. Gotcha. Okay. Um, high society. So you have a Victorian farmhouse. So it's still on a farm. It's still they're still uh, their priority is still more utilitarian but they still have money and they want to show off a little bit, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a good distinction. <laughs> Ooh, you have a pretty ceiling. You're showing me your ceiling. Oh, right yeah, now. I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I don't know if I told you, but we learned recently that our house was actually built in the 1860s. We thought it was 1890s. <gasps> yeah, oh, so wow. we didn't know that because that's not what it said on the whatever you get when you buy a house. But we talked to yeah. someone who owned it previously and she said, no, that's wrong. It's actually 1860. So who knows? But yeah, this part, um, this part was original and it has a plank ceiling to it. I don't know. It's pretty, pretty Gorgeous. fun. Yeah. We like it. Yeah. So when, when we bought our house, it said, it said 1910 on the, on the Zillow listing. Yeah. And then we went to come see, we went to look at the house and we looked on the corner of the actual building, and it's like carved in the stone, 1893. Eh, well, that gives so, it away. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, so we were like, okay, well, here's the truth. And then uh, do you have your abstract of title? A lot of people, if they're interested in finding out the, the history of their home, can look up their abstract of title. It'll tell every owner that has ever owned your house. That would be really interesting. No, we know very, very little. I mean, we, we've collected a little bit more, but we, we'd like to know a lot more because, yeah, we know next to nothing about the house or the barn, but yeah, it'd be fun to dig into it a bit more. Actually, originally, like you said, your Zillow listing, our Zillow listing said 1930s. Oh. And then when we got here and we looked around, I'm like, I don't no. think so. Wow, that's way off. <laughs> yeah, it has a stone foundation. Yeah, way off, way off. That's actually how it was sold to us. But oh no, it's gosh. it's definitely not built in the 1930s. <laughs> well, some people will lie because they 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 know that most people want a, a younger house, um, and so right. But you actually value the fact that it's older, so that's cool. Yeah, I was actually happy when I heard it was 19 or 1860s. I was like, ooh, it's even older. Yeah. <laughs> like this must have been one of the first houses around here. Yeah, that's you awesome. Know, if it's that old but okay so on to the the topic yeah sorry um, you we yeah no no it's fun I like all of this discussion I think we could do several episodes oh yeah I could talk for years but I know <laughs> it's such a it's so yeah so you and I both get asked a lot or assumed that in order to take a property like this you have to sink a whole lot of money into it. And honestly, you guys do a much better job of this than we do. So, um, it, you know, explain to us the process of buying your home and you even have a little farm and you have acreage and a barn. So are you independently wealthy or how'd you get this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I won the lottery. No. Um, yeah. So 
Yes, I get asked this so often. There is a huge misconception that you have to be filthy rich to own land, to um, own a old house, all of that, and to own animals even. It's, okay, so this might, I, I just assumed that this was common knowledge, but the the number one thing that we do is we just live within our means. Um, it's not rocket science. <laughs> you know, it it's sounds simpler than it is, but it or easier than it is. It's simple, but it isn't easy, you know? Yep. So I was trying to think when you told me you were gonna you were gonna ask me about this, I kind of made a mental list of kind of all of the things that we just started our marriage out with um, in order to get us to this place and to kind of start our lifestyle of just living within our means. You know, we cut our own hair. We we drive cars that we bought off Craigslist. We don't go out to eat hardly ever. We, we don't go anywhere really. Like we just um, our find our entertainment where we are at our home with with each other you know we just don't buy anything unless we have the money like we don't have credit cards we just so if you live if you are in a lifestyle and a mindset of living within your means so you have that foundation to start with and so what we did and I think this is kind of what you did is we bought a fixer-upper of our first house and that was kind of like building our assets. So we bought this house that was, it was 2010, 2009, something, something around there where, where it was like the mar- market crash and we got a, for a foreclosure, we fixed it up and that's where we kind of dipped our toe into DIY. And my husband had never fixed anything. He had never built anything. He didn't know anything. I didn't know anything either. We didn't know anything about restoration, about history, anything. We just knew old houses are pretty. That's it. That's where we started with. We just bought this beautiful old Victorian and we fixed it up and then we sold it for like double what we paid for it or triple. I don't know. We bought it for 74000 and then we sold it for 200000 Nice. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's where we came from, uh, to, to get here. We had that, um, little nest egg or whatever. Equity. Equity. And yeah. we didn't, you know, do anything super amazing. Anybody can do that. But I think what ha- helped us is that we didn't have any debt. So we didn't have any college debt. We didn't have any wedding debt or credit card debt or any kind of debt. So we got to keep Car all debt. of that all of that money and put it towards our house and we didn't buy a new house and we didn't buy a nice house we bought a house that people told us should be torn down (laughs) and um yeah (laughs) and and part of that is because people don't see the value in old things and we do and part of that was there was some damage that we needed to fix but we paid cash for this farm and then we did have to get a loan a small loan for um, like a construction type loan. Once we got into the house, we found out there was more issues than we initially knew of. And so we did have to kind of, we basically do have a mortgage now because of that, but that's the only debt we have. Right, I mean, that is not, that's, that's incredible. I think people also see the dream of buying an old farmhouse and buying, even land and having a little farm, it seems like just something that'll always stay a dream. It seems like an impractical thing to do. So how, what made you decide that it was a dream worth shooting for, even though you just had an ordinary budget, ordinary life? Well, I'd say we have, uh, um, my husband, you know, he just loads trucks at a where in a warehouse and I'm a stay at home mom. So we're actually like below average <laughs> on our income level, but we both have college degrees and we decided in s- early on in our marriage, we took a Dave Ramsey class at church and we just got to early on in our marriage, evaluate what is our value system. And we decided we valued above a career. We evalu- we valued spending time together 
and we valued history, we valued art, and we valued where we lived above where we worked. Because it's, you, are not, you are not where you work. That doesn't define you. Um, and I feel like letting go of that has helped us put our dream of living on a farm kind of, it's not more, it's not really a dream. It's more of a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Choice. Choice. And so once we realized, okay, that's, that's what we want to reach for. We want to live on a, we want to live where ev- as far as the eye can see in every direction is just nature so that we can basically have a farm that is our art studio and be able to be inspired and create beautiful things and restore a piece of history. Like we're just very nerdy and romantic and we didn't really, because we were so young and, and maybe people would call us stupid. Um, we didn't think big career, big, you know, boat, you know, the usual things that people see as success. We saw a house and a farm as success and we just took baby steps to move towards that. I don't know. It's, it's, It also depends on where in the country you live. Like the Midwest, it has the lowest cost of living. I think that helps a lot. That's true. I could think of a million ways to have this kind of house and property here in Missouri as well. So that is something too. I know that's not a buying an old farmhouse isn't something that's going to be on everyone's, you know, it's not going to work in every person's location. But I think that everything mm-hmm. you shared is really inspiring because you you took what you and your husband value and you chased after that, even though it's not the usual the usual way. And I think a lot of people want to do something like that, but they're really scared yeah. or just held back by yes. their beliefs. And you guys just went for it. Well, and we were told, so we bought this house before Michael had a job. <laughs> so we just... We looked for a house and we said, well, Michael can work at, there are warehouses everywhere. And so Michael can find a warehouse job after we find our house. So we put house first. You know, a lot of people look for a job and then they look for a house. And so we looked for our house first because that was our priority. And then after we bought the house, then he looked for the job. (laughs) Yeah, that, that is different. (laughs) But obviously, if that was something you guys felt so strong... Okay, I'm going to wait till my, my child leaves this room before I keep talking. Johanna, you could wait to get water. This is having older children. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, come on here. Seriously. Did you... That obviously opened up your... What was your range? Like, you would have gone anywhere in all of Kansas yep. or... Okay. Well, uh, we, we, my parents live on the border of Oklahoma and we just looked at a map and we kind of drew a four hour circle around where they lived. And we just said, you know, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to be within four hours of grandma. And so that's, and that was our only perimeter. And it was hilarious because we, we contacted a realtor and realtors were like, uh, you want me to look at houses in a four our radius around this. Yeah, I've like, never heard of we that don't, We don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but Dave Ramsey has this quote. I love this quote. He says, uh, you got to live like no one else so that someday you can live like no one else. Have you heard that before? Oh, like a million times. I'm like an obsessive Dave Ramsey person. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, like we don't do everything that he says. Like we're not um, perfect and we don't have like this amazing budget that we follow rigidly. Oh, I don't anything. at all either. Not at all. I just like what he okay. stands for. I don't. Yeah. Right. I don't. I've never done the envelope system. I honestly still use credit cards yeah. for the rewards. Like because I pay them off. And I know that's oh, like wow. so not Dave Ramsey, but like. Dude, I'm going to pay them off. Like, it really okay. will save yeah. me money. But anyways, yeah. all that aside, yeah, I've totally heard the uh, live like no one else later. You can live and give like no one else. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're only given one precious life. And I feel like everybody feels so um, pressured to keep up with the Joneses and do what everybody else is doing. And, you know, just honestly, just... 
sit down with your spouse, figure out what are your goals and your priorities. And if it's like nothing else that anybody else is doing, so what? <laughs> like, yes. Um, and we even, even our parents, both of our sets of parents were like, wait, you don't have a job and you're moving 18 hours away. Cause, uh, right after college, we got married and we lived by his parents in Georgia for a while. That's where our first house was. And then we moved, uh, like 14 hours away and with no job. We just <laughs> went after you guys, this house. You guys did go for it. <laughs> and this house. And this is a house that looked like it was going to fall over. Like it, it had a couch. We, there was a couch with a beehive in it, in the field. There oh my was gosh. trash everywhere. It just, it wasn't like a big, you know how it, I've been in two magazines now, Yeah. but people don't realize when we bought this house, <laughs> like my mom, the first time she saw it, she, she said that she had this like secret talk with our realtor and was like, can you tell them not to buy this? Tell them not to buy it. <laughs> She's probably <laughs> thinking, oh, my artsy Sarah, what has she gotten herself into now? <laughs> yep, yep. Always yep. dreaming That's... of something. <laughs> yes, and she's not living in reality. But yeah. now people now people are catching up with our dream, and they're like, oh, they can see it now. Well, yeah, you um, had the vision when you walked in. And mm -hmm. that is, that is how I feel too. And my husband was telling me just the other day, he's like, I'm really glad you could see it because both of the houses we bought, we walked in and like, I was the only one who was beaming, like so excited. I could see it. It's just beautiful. And they're like, why are you so excited about this place? This is, this makes no <laughs> I sense. I remember the pictures of your old house where it's like purple walls and stuff. Oh, it was madness, um, but I could see it, yeah, you know? I'm with you. And that's the thing. You got to have vision for the whole picture, your house, the vision for your life, how you want to live your life, how you want to train up your children, how you want to do everything. You can't just let, you can't just let life happen. You've got to be intentional about it if you want to live like no one else. <laughs> right, right. So... Yeah. And that is, that's a unique story. <laughs> Four hour radius where we can <laughs> fix up this place. <laughs> but yep. another thing to talk about is patience because you have been in mm. your farmhouse now for four or five years at this six. point, six years. It'll be six, six years in a couple days. And yeah. it is not completely done. And you probably have lot, like a whole list of projects that you wish were done, but aren't. So how do you, cause when you're on a budget, you're not going to bring someone in and just have them finish this all in a month. Like they do on fixer upper. That's definitely not how it is. Okay. So there's a certain level this of sacrifice and patience. Craziness? Yeah. And craziness. <laughs> <laughs> so I, first I'll start off by saying like, Yes, I love to share beautiful pictures on Instagram and on my blog. I'm one of those people that I don't like sharing my dirty dishes and my dirty laundry. I don't feel like that's empowering because honestly, when I see pictures of that, it's it's stressful to see, you know. So I like, as an artist, I guess, I just love to share beautiful things. But I do regularly in my stories or just talk about the fact that we have two gutted rooms currently. Um, a bathroom and a bedroom is completely gutted. And then my husband and I are sleeping on the back porch on a mattress on the ground. <laughs> um, and we, we call it, we call it fancy camping. Uh, we are inside te technically, but yeah. we're kind of camping and it's very, uh, romantic and cozy, I would say, but not ideal. And I know when I tell women, women that, they say, uh, how do you do it? I could not do that. Um, and, I, and this whole fixer-upper, like, HGTV, 45 minutes and your whole house is done thing, is, you're right, it's just unattainable. I think what happened is this house changed me. So the first year uh, that we were here, I had in my mind, like, six weeks 
six weeks, we're gonna have uh, the kitchen done, the whole house done, and it will be, you know, Joanna perfect. And that was just, that was just being naive and just, we just didn't know anything. And then we started getting into the project. We found the termite damage. We found all these things. And I just remember at one point we had the whole downstairs because the, the bottom, the sill plate of our house was rotted. So the thing that your entire house sits on is called a sill plate and it was gone. We were living in this house for a year before we found that out. And, you know, Kansas is very windy. We could have died. <laughs> uh, and this house passed an, an, an inspection. So I don't know how, but it did. And I just remember the first year I had two babies. I had a three-year-old and a newborn. And I remember sitting in the one room in my house that was semi-done. And I just was, like, bawling my eyes out. Then I had this, like, vision or, like... A picture in my mind of a woman my age with two little babies in a mud hut in a you know an actual third world country situation and it was like right. a, it was like a slap in the face like wake up you have nothing perspective nothing to be complaining about nothing to be crying about um yeah perspective is everything and I think my first world problems kind of melted away at that moment and I was able to just enjoy the process. And we went four years without a kitchen. We had no kitchen, no sink, no stove, no nothing for four years. And we lived in this house. Are you serious? For four years. Four years? Four years. <laughs> oh my gosh. I thought my six months was like... I thought I just won Saint of the Year Award or something, but <laughs> apparently not. And I would go to church on Sunday and people would say, are you done with your kitchen yet? And I'd be like, no. And it would be like years of them asking this. And I would like get to the point where I would like hide from people because I was just hated that question. But at home, I was fine because whenever I would get sad, I would just go outside and that was, the, that was the gift of this place is that I just found peace in the farm part. So when my house was an absolute disaster, I would just go outside and I could breathe, you know. And the pastoral views everywhere would just like, I would be reminded of what's important and what, what why we moved here, the whys. And it just kind of helped take it away. And then when we finally did get the kitchen done four years later and it's beautiful yeah like and it would not have been I would not love it as much if I had not you know been able to agonize over every detail and find the perfect pieces and do everything by hand with my husband like we did everything by hand we built the countertops we built everything we put everything where it is and there was no you know, prefab anything or store bought any, like it's all hand or antique or something. And it's so meaningful. So it was worth it. So satisfying to look around and see that you've done all of that. Yeah. All just with just a bunch of perseverance, really. <laughs> Not any, you know, training, just patience and perseverance and learning as you go. And it's been very cool. It's been this training ground for our marriage, like growing us um, like a stronger marriage. It's helped us through our adoption. I don't think four years of waiting for a kitchen, um, I think really helped prepare me for the long wait of this adoption because I've just, I've just kind of grown to learn that good things are worth waiting for. And that's very different than we're used to. Mm. And it's, it's so not what we want. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't I don't want to sound mm. like I'm I've got it all together and I'm so perfect and I never get upset. My husband will tell you that I do have like my little temper tantrum moments where I act like a 2-year-old <laughs> and I'm like, "I want a bedroom." <laughs> you know, um but it usually it usually doesn't last long and I just try to find what I'm grateful for and it really just helps 
to be on a farm, I think. Yeah, especially right now. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. The winter Right is now, hard. everything is just... Yeah, winter's hard. I was just... I wrote in an email to my email subscribers just today that I was starting to question over the last few months, like, why we even bought this place. And then now I'm like, la -ti da this is why. <laughs> like, that's right, spring. Yes. It all just turns into the most beautiful, magical thing when I'm outside and like, wow, this place is so pretty. And you guys and, did such yeah. a good job um, on your goat pin. I was going to tell you, you have a cute goat pin. I love it. Thank you. I, yeah, it's really helping now too, to have some more animals here. It's really making it feel mm -hmm. more like a farm and what we were envisioning. And that took a year, over a year to get our first animals here other than, than the dog, because just there again, patience, we didn't have any fencing. We needed to get the kitchen done first. Mm -hmm. There's just, you have to be okay with that slow process and being patient because it can, we came to this house with a five-year plan. Like this is not getting done by next year. I'm not even going to pretend it will, you know, or I would have been very upset because yeah. it's not, and it won't be. What, what do you still have left to do? Not a whole lot with the house. Like we have all three bathrooms need to be renovated, but that's not something that feels pressing to me. I mean, they're, they're functional. They're not pretty, but they're functional, mm -hmm. but just like with the whole property, like we want to fence in all seven acres. We want to completely redo the other cottage, like top to bottom. We want to put in an orchard and bu berry bushes. We just did some more raised beds and a garden fence. So just so many things, you know, all over the place. We feel like we're in a good place right now. Everything feels at least comfortable. So that's good. Yeah. I feel like you're making a lot of progress. Um, what I see, at least I'm just like, wow, it's really, it's really cool to see. And you know, I love seeing another piece of history being saved, being preserved. So good job. Thank <laughs> I'm you. I'm so excited yes, about yeah, that. Yeah, no, we are, we, we fall more in love with this place, like all the time. It's interesting how um, a piece of history does that, how it draws you in, how it's almost like romancing you and like yeah. <laughs> um, you notice things, you notice little details every every day. They're like, oh, wow. I, like I was in the, in the pasture the other day and I saw a pile of rocks and I just had the realization like rocks don't pile themselves. I bet a farmer yeah, did where'd that. This come from? I bet he was he was picking them out of the field, you know, because to have to plow around the rocks, you know, would be really tough. And so, you know, and then I just just was like, oh, that's so charming to have that pile of rocks and to know that some farmer was plowing his field and and tossed them there, and you know, just like everything has a story. Yeah. Every, every scratch, every scratch on your floor, every, uh, you know, wonky board, every, every detail of your home is like, yeah, a piece well, of especially when you so. have a barn, you know, just today, Luke pulled out two of mm. these, they, we think they're from the 1960s hand painted advertisement signs and they're really cool looking. Yeah. Oh, he wow. pulled them out of the barn and cleaned them off. But yeah, we find endless treasures around this place. The other day we were going to make some borders and he found all of these old bricks from who knows where. Yeah. You're always finding yeah. things. <laughs> you're always finding things that are half buried and you're like, Oh What's wow. This? <laughs> you become a, like a archeologist of your home. Yeah. Of your property. So many good things. Tell everyone where we can find you. I know you're on Instagram and YouTube. Well, I was in the beginning I don't know how you do it, Lisa. I don't know how you do it. Because <laughs> in the beginning, I tried to have... So I have a YouTube channel, and I have a blog, and pin Pinterest, and Facebook, and Instagram. And I just felt like I was stretching myself really thin, and I wasn't doing anything well. So I just tried to pick... Well, where are most people, like, listening or paying attention to what I'm sharing? And that that looked like it was Instagram. So I've kind of mostly focused on Instagram, um, Briarton Farm on Instagram. So that's mostly where I share. But every once in a while, um, I pay attention to the yeah. other I, <laughs> social media handles. Yeah, but. well, and she shares so much on her Instagram. There's, I, you, your stories are always really great. And I love watching your little girls because they're so sweet. 
Yay. Well, thank you so much for joining me on here. I'm so glad to finally have you on here after you were pretty much the first episode I thought of. So, <laughs> Aw, thank you. This was really fun. And despite all the technical difficulties, you we finally made it work. <laughs> Yay. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I hope that Sarah and I were encouraging and you know that you can follow after whatever dream you have, even if you don't have a huge income. Little known fact, my very first free ebook I ever wrote is on the farmhouse style and I offer that ebook for free. You can get that at bit.ly slash farmhouse on Boone style. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Mm-hmm.